so thank you everyone for joining us to, uh, for the co-creative session. Uh, today we have data for creative organizations uh, presented by Lori Zapalak. Uh, so we're discussing using data to understand project context, measure engagement and assess impact. Uh, Co-Creative Sessions is a free and accessible online series geared to enrich, educate, and connect creatives through a series of workshops and training sessions. Uh, this is funded by Mass Development and the Bar Foundation and is a program, uh, a component of the TDI Creative Cities Initiative to boost the arts-based economic development in New Bedford. Uh, so I will hand it over to Lori and she's gonna do a presentation for us. Thank you, Dima. Awesome. Hi, um, thank you everyone for, uh, for spending your lunch before the holiday uh, is upon us soon. I really appreciate the time. And today, as Nina said, we're gonna talk about data. Um, I'm gonna start off with a few definitions and then touch on um, some key concepts with uh, some examples and a, a small case study before opening it up to questions. Um, and I want to acknowledge, um, I actually didn't take a statistics class until I was 36 years old. <laughs> so, um, you know, I come, I'd say from a, a qualitative research background, but um, I'm very much still learning new things about working with um, quantitative data. So this is um, a chance for me to learn as well. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, I'm just going to start off with a few, a few baseline examples. Some of this may be familiar territory to some of you all, um, and then go through um, a good bit about descriptive statistics and sources for these. Um, there's many more sources out there for you to take advantage of, um, uh, and some really interesting things. We'll talk about research design, actually re refining your research question. Uh, collecting and mapping data. There's some amazing tools there. Um, using data or pulling data across platforms and social media analytics just a bit, and then integrating data into storytelling. Um, so to begin with, just the difference between data and information. Um, if any of you as a kid read the book Swimmy by Leo Leone, <laughs> I think this is a good illustration. If you think of data as the individual bits or the individual fish uh, in, in what becomes this larger fish, information is a collection of data um, that, that has meaning because we either categorize it or uh, we see a larger pattern or we see outliers like Swimmy who, who serves as the eyeball of this um, invented larger fish. Um, and you might uh, be familiar you know, with the term empirical or hear things like evidence-based or data-driven. There's a lot of this lingo that's thrown around these days. And I think it's because we <clears throat> a bit are having a, lot of, a, a love affair with quantitative data because we can uh, get into big data and very easily get overwhelmed with it, in fact. Um, but I would also assert that good qualitative research, which allows us to really develop rich or thick descriptions of, of events or to understand deeply why someone chose to do what they did, their motivations, um, is really valuable as well. Um, and a lot of uh, great research actually represents um, combining those two methods. So what gets called mixed methods, where you're combining both qualitative and quantitative approaches. So for instance, you'll see samples that might include multiple choice questions or sliding scales, um, but then they'll also have open-ended, pardon me, open-ended questions where um, the person can elaborate, you know, and sometimes that's the most helpful because you get it in the context of that other quantitative data. Um, and when we do talk about collecting data and trying to understand trends, usually we're not, uh, for instance, surveying an entire population. We're just trying to get a representative sample. And so, you know, this is um, fun and tricky and interesting because the samples are not always representative, even if we try really well to, um, to, to, to seek out that representation. So it's always 
interesting to be aware, like if you've done interviews or if you've um, done a survey, you know, that question of, well, who did we not reach? Um, so that you can think about that for the next time. Um, but, but the goal is that by taking a sample of the population, it's, it's efficient and it's representative so that you can uh, reach some broader conclusions about what's going on in, in, in the population that you're studying. So whether that's New Bedford or um, everyone that you sent a, a flyer out to, or um, if you do a survey of individuals who come into to your museum, you know, this idea that you're getting glimpses into um, the experience or the event that, that they've experienced. So this idea that an individual fish essentially here represents data, but by collecting and combining and coding, you know, that's when you start to derive the information from the data. But we, we often say data driven, data this, but we're really talking about information and ultimately insight or, or, or knowledge that we're trying to get to. And then, and then this is what I was um, referring to when talking about a sample of a population that you're not, you're, you're, unless you're dealing with a very small population, you're usually not um, interviewing or, or uh, delivering or getting a survey from everyone in the population. But the goal is to get a good representative sample when you're doing that type of research. And then just transitioning to this idea of different types of of quantitative research, um, when, when um, we do uh, collect information, um, one of the things we often do is develop statistics to report in a really efficient way about um, whether it's a community or how many people participated. And um, so I want to mention that there are some, and this is an, pardon me, an infographic from Esri Business Analyst, which is a paid subscription. Um, but for those of you who have a university affiliation, it may be something you have access to. That's actually a key theme in all this. I'll come back to that later. Um, but it also shows that, you know, this is just a snapshot of New Bedford um, in terms of some key summary statistics. And I think something else that this emphasizes is when you can take quantitative data but make it visual and an infographic, it's often a lot easier for people to absorb and also remember. So that's important too. Um, and something that we're seeing, so this is another, another format um, uh, from Esri, information that's available. And here I bring this up because I know many of you are concerned with, well, what are the characteristics of the, um, you know, of the population of the South Coast, for instance? You know, th those people who were in your, your kind of immediate market that might come to your event or your organization. So there are things like records of, or um, pardon me, statistics on, they're not, they're not full records, but um, information about spending habits by, um, by community. And so this is important when you're thinking about how to reach out and convey your value to a particular group. And then what we're seeing more and more of is this move into um, not just demographic data, but also um, socioeconomic data. So in this, in the lower right here, you see this thing that says tapestry segments. And what Esri has done, I'm just gonna bring another two or three slides on this so you can see, is they've actually mapped every neighborhood in the United States and they've taken data from the census and data from other sources to look at some of these broader, um, not, not only um, age, representation, race, but also income, education level to kind of to categorize characteristics into what they call these segments or, or life modes. And um, it is not perfect by any means but it does start, to, it gives you something to have a conversation around in terms of people that you might be seeing who come to your events and kind of what are their characteristics and what are their, you know, what are their interests? And, and, and I think this, this stuff is really interesting to see, like, does it actually match up with what you're seeing, um, what you're observing? So this is the broad map of the US that they did 
um, and by which they derived this tapestry segmentation, they actually um, they they included the variable of income, and you you do see that you know you can talk about income. You see a lot of that orange and the the um, uh, in New England, which correlates with affluence, which is really interesting when you look across the United States, uh, as well as age. I'm just kind of looking at this in brief, and then this is their um, uh, their broader code, and so you'll see not just characteristics at the kind of the broad level, but some of these sub levels. And so it starts to get really interesting in terms of um, are you engaging people that that are kind of known to be supporters of arts and culture, or are you trying to reach out to people who are coming to, to the South Coast because they like beach vacations and they're on their way to Cape Cod? You know, so some of this information can kind of be helpful for um, for thinking about your communication with the people you're trying to reach. And I think it also forces us to look beyond like just saying we're trying to reach everybody and to really focus in on how do we connect with different groups, especially groups that we might not have been pardon me, successful in connecting with in the past. So um, in addition to, to that set of information, I also just want to remind you there's a little bit of, um, you know, you can always go to Wikipedia for a kind of the quick down and dirty for some key statistics. And if you do that, I'd recommend not just citing what Wikipedia says, but go to whatever is cited there. So like go to the footnotes. Um, the US Census information is all available online. And then there's some other great subscriptions um, like Social Explorer through which you can get it really easily. Uh, the next release of data, I believe is coming at the end of August. So we're gonna have a lot more information on from the 2020 census. And then for those of you who do have um, a connection with UMass Dartmouth, um, there's some amazing, or any other university, some amazing resources that you can tap um, to, and it's everything from, you might be trying to use data to learn just even more about a location, you know, your own, your own building. Um, but also there are resources like Mintel. You can also go to mintel.com for some free content and it's global market research. So, um, it's, it's really amazing. And then a lot of location data, um, is available that the industry lead is, is Esri, ArcGIS, and Business Analyst, but you do have to pay to use that um, or, or go through a university subscription is what I'd say is a really good way to go if you've got a, a partner. Um, this, for instance, is uh, from Mintel's Global Consumer Trends Report that they did for 2021. Um, and I bring this up because I read it and I was like, that's really interesting. I relate to this, you know, I relate to this kind of health, health undefined concept. And the report dives into each of these themes much, you know, much more deeply. But so for instance, if you're thinking about uh, your social media campaign and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do next? Or how do we make this this exhibit kind of tie into what else is going on in the world. You know, resources like this, I think, are great. Um, and this is a free report. Um, they also did a report on, uh, on trends in ice cream this year, which I think would be fun to read. Um, so beyond uh, descriptive data, I think, you know, this question of what are you really trying to get at? You know, I think just describing uh, um, like putting your work in context or really understanding the demographic characteristics of New Bedford, some of that kind of is really helpful if you're trying to argue for funding, for instance, and reaching new audiences. You all probably know this already. Um, but when you're thinking about, um, you know, engaging the visitor or the consumer, you know, just having good accurate counts of, you know, how many people attended, um, who attended, can you categorize them? Uh, did they enjoy the program? You know, it's how much? You know, some of those things can be really helpful. Um, but you might also be looking for broader um, questions about causation, you know, which is the why did they attend? Um, and that's really important information. Sometimes it can be hard to get at. Um, and so it's also critical to think about that that's that may not just be one question, you know, it may be how did they know about the event, but then also what motivated them to attend. 
So, you know, you might be able to see, for instance, if you look at um, social media analytics, that you're reaching a certain geography effectively. Um, but so you could deduce it there. And then if you see, in, for instance, point of sale data, that you've got some correlation or matching between where you pushed that, that social media post and the, the zip codes of who's coming in for that event, but you still don't know exactly why, you know, why, what it was in your message or if it was that social media post or something else. So being able to kind of come around and, and, and find ways to engage at least a sample of individuals about what motivated you to attend is really, really important. Um, and, uh, and there are always the kind of the questions and the risks about, can you distinguish between causation, some A causing B and correlation? Um, so, you know, just because sales of burgers go, go up the night of an AHA event doesn't necessarily mean that AHA caused that, it might just be correlated, but who knows? Maybe, maybe we can actually figure out a way um, uh, to see that there is a causal relationship there. Um, so then I'm gonna shift gears a bit and, and chat briefly about collecting and mapping data, because this is also something that, that we're seeing more and more. And I'm gonna give you a couple of rules of thumb. Um, one is uh, most of you probably have some type of customer relationship management program, or maybe even an Excel program with your, your membership list or a mailing list. Um, if you have that, that's a great starting point for actually being able to spatialize that data. And um, so just some basic rules of thumb to do that efficiently is um, one, do use some type of spreadsheet or database program. And two, to think in advance kind of the design of that to, so that you are actually setting up things that you might want to categorize, like distinct cells of information. Um, and in doing that, you want to aim for consistency, use drop down lists if possible. If you're, if you're aiming to analyze and categorize that data, um, that'll save you a lot of uh, scrubbing in the end. Um, and then particularly around addresses, I really recommend using complete information from the outset. Um, and that means having a different field for address, the street address, the number, the city, the state, and the zip. Because then if you do want to um, put that into a mapping program, whether that's Google Maps or, or um, an ArcGIS program, it's going to make it a whole lot quicker. Um, and uh, the cool thing is if you have that um, and you put it into Google Maps, they're going to geocode it. They're going to find the XY coordinates and actually convert these lists into points, which I'll show you. But um, that's also what GIS does. And there's a process of geocoding that now more and more is just built into programs. So there's a lot of this backend stuff that you don't have to worry too much about, which is great. Um, and just as a, a couple quick examples, um, I don't know who did this, but somebody did this and y'all probably do. But um, this uh, um, self-guided public uh, art tour of the AV, um, if you click on each of these, there's an image and an address for each of these works of art. And, um, and the creator then made this very simple linear, you know, line that connects them. This is brilliant. You know, it's really simple um, and it's very accessible because it's Google. If you want to um, get more fine tuned and look to do things like build upon that type of concept, but even integrate video or music or more imagery, kind of the imagery at the same time the map shows up, um, Esri Story Maps is, uh, is available for free. There, there are these free templates. There's no coding, no GIS involved. You are just providing the core content and kind of moving the icons around. Um, there's also a paid version, but I think this is a pretty cool resource. And there's some great examples of things that have been done about arts and culture um, on the Story Maps website. Um, and then as an example of um, collecting and mapping data to put it into GIS, I've been working with Margo to do this. And we're now kind of scrubbing this data um, so that we can start to see and ask questions about why are certain artists co-locating? Co you know, like we see these clusters emerge and find that to be really interesting, you know, uh, in terms and what, and that there's a lot of really good things about that. Um, 
And then the, the fifth and kind of almost final point um, that I wanted to, to bring up is about, and there's gonna be a little case study with this, about pulling data across platforms and using social media analytics. Um, uh, I want to give folks a heads up if you don't know that um, Facebook analytics is in the process of changing. So if you have data um, uh, from an event on Facebook, if you are an admin, you can download that uh, until tomorrow. <laughs> I would go back and do that. So you have it even if you figure out what you wanna do with it later. Um, and then something you may know already, but let's say you have a personal account on Instagram, you can change that to a business account and back to a personal account easily. With the business version of the account, you get more access to insights. They're also going to encourage you to promote and buy ads. But, um, but it's interesting because as an artist, my guess is many artists are probably just using a personal account, but I would advise you to play around with shifting to a business account. Um, and then there are, there's another set of tools. This, this is in just kind of the heads up category that Facebook Business Suite is in development, which is gonna allow for management of social media across channel, across their um, channels, their, <coughs> excuse me, their products, um, and as well as ads manager, ads manager and events manager. Um, and then many of you are probably using Google Analytics. You can set it up for multiple sites. It's free. Um, it takes a little bit to get into it, but there are great tutorials online. So I encourage you um, to, to seek those out. And I've included one. And again, it's in evolution. So um, just set up Google Analytics 4 on your Squarespace site if you have that. I've listed this link here below. Um, and, uh, and then sites like Squarespace, um, you, you probably do know, but, and, and I'll show this in this case, um, but there are really rich analytics available that are, are quite easy to work with. So as an example, um, in 2019, I worked with um, the, a partnership in Fall River. This was um, before Fall River had joined the Mass Development TDI program. And there was a goal to kind of test out the program, test out the partnership and be sure that they were ready to commit to the full TDI, Transformative Development Initiative program, the adventure, if you will. And um, so the idea was, it was to launch a first initiative and just be sure everybody had the bandwidth to carry it out successfully. And then, and then that would be kind of the first step into the TDI program. So um, in 2017, Fall River had launched a new brand, Make It Here, 2019. Um, you know, this partnership was in formation and starting to focus on the revitalization of Main Street. And so this first initiative uh, that was concocted was, um, was Taste Fall River. And the idea was to strengthen the partnership, drive attention to positive narratives. You know, this was just after the mayor had been indicted. And so this goal was like, let's use this and really kind of redirect the narrative towards things that uh, we want to celebrate in Fall River. And so um, this branded event was, was developed by the partnership. And, um, and we found creative ways to weave together the city brand, the make it here, with the event brand, which was, you know, the Taste Fall River. So things like make it a date night, make it a girls night, make it a family feast, join us for Taste Fall River and Fall River Restaurant Week. Um, and uh, so, you know, this was the beginning of this launch. Um, somebody from the committee did this real down and dirty map. Uh, we created an information kit about really the economic development opportunities that, that we were seeing in Main Street. So that the idea was, we're gonna reach out and kind of broadcast these positive things and, and let people know of the opportunities as well that, that, that the city had waiting for them. So just a couple of images of, the, of some of the content from this information kit. Um, and then what we did is we created a very simple website on Squarespace. We linked it to Eventbrite and social media and wrote a press release. And so from that, the, the, that kit, we had essentially our branding, we had an online sales platform, and we had a way to get feedback simultaneously. So we, we didn't actually even use Google Analytics for this. And um, what that allowed us to do, this is 
just a bit more content from the kind of the kit of information that went out to people, very much driving home the Macon and Fall River means you, you know, there's opportunity here, whether you're a restaurateur, or a brewer, someone who's going to invest in real estate. Um, and uh, so, you know, really driving those themes. And then what we did, what we were able to see just by looking very simply at these analytics was we were able to see a correlation of, between the press release when postings went out through certain media like fun103.com where we would see the uptick in the hits on, um, on our website and um, we're also able to see when that converted to ticket sales. So, you know, we're at least being able to see this correlation. Um, and then the other thing that this did for us was there was um, some debate from within the committee as to whether or not Taste Fall River would attract people from outside of Fall River. And um, we knew that for that to happen, we had to be able to sell tickets. So we needed Eventbrite. We needed an online platform because we knew people wouldn't drive to Fall River to buy a ticket. To, it just, you know, we needed to give them that opportunity. And um, so we, we were able to, set, to see that, yes, you know, we had people, um, we actually had a high degree, the second highest um, uh, coverage for the website was from Boston, which we were thrilled about. Um, uh, in addition to what was, I'd say, an expected South Coast market. So, you know, it felt like our intuition was, was somewhat right, um, but that we were also able to see, you know, that, that if, if you build it, they will come, so to speak. Um, and, um, and then importantly, it confirmed even this willingness to pay online, which was, at, which was in question, um, you know, at that time. So, um, you know, in terms of the outcomes, the event was successful in moving the ball down the field. Um, and that meant, you know, selling more than 400 tickets, um, providing revenue, new customers for businesses, and really kind of setting things in motion for, for another annual event. But I'd say that the social returns on this were even higher. And just go back a slide real quick. These images were all from either the day of the event or or, or during the event itself, we kind of took an Oscars approach and we said, we're gonna document the restaurant tours preparing for the event. We're gonna document people participating and we're gonna chat about the after party too. And it seemed to have worked. Um, even, even on the small scale you know, of this kind of new fledgling event. Um, and so these were also different types of, of feedback or data that we were able to look at. You know, what was the type of response we were getting to the images during the event, for instance? And I'd say one of the, one of the lessons that we learned is the, the, um, the marketing before the event had really focused on pictures of beautiful food, but there's a difference between pictures of beautiful food and pictures of people enjoying beautiful food. So that was one lesson learned. Don't forget the people. <laughs> Seems obvious, but don't forget the people. Um, and then, you know, getting uh, responses from this guy, Patrick Jordan, he wrote this the night of the event. Like he went home from the event, got on Facebook and hammered this out. And um, uh, I don't think he was a plant. <laughs> um, and, you know, just expressing like his, you know, his pride and his enjoyment and seeing, seeing the city in a new lens. And so, you know, this is, uh, it's one data point, but it correlates with um, and respond, it kind of fits in with the other response that, that the event received. Um, so it was great to have it. Um, and I'd say one of the other things that we did that was really critical is we actually immediately after the event surveyed or, or rather did kind of a, a semi-structured interview with restaurateurs to ask them about their experiences. And that was just critical, both in hearing the positive responses, but also what could be done better. Um, so then finally, uh, uh, thinking about kind of, you get this information, how do you share it? Um, and, and in what context? And, I think that there are some really, um, you know, now more than ever, there's just an endless ways to integrate your data into your storytelling. And a concept I really like a lot, you know, this idea of triangulation where you're using more than one um, uh, method or one source to collect data on the same topic. And so it's a way to both test the validity of the sources you're using 
um, you know, if like if one of them is really off and the others kind of match up, then you should probably do some additional work. But also giving back this variety of, of data is a way that it, it enriches um, the description in, in your storytelling. It allows you to both show and tell um, with images, words, maps, you know, numbers. Um, and, it, and it is evidence-based storytelling. So um, I think it's a really good construct. And I know um, like in the museum studies realm, the idea um, of multivocalism, it's, there's, there's some relationship there where um, by hearing about an event from multiple people, multiple viewpoints, you actually get a richer dimensionality and more meaning um, you know, conveyed about the event. Kind of same thing here. So as, um, as one tiny, <laughs> tiny example of to see how this can also come out in a product, um, I uh, was thrilled and fascinated to see the coverage about the New Bedford Light in the New York Times this week and really, really interested in kind of the narrative that they are um, sharing with the world about New Bedford. And so I just, I just kind of took the, the couple pages and said, well, what tools did they use? And I'd recommend anytime you find something that's really effective, um, you know, break it down. And so, you know, just this assembly of, you've got this very composed portrait group, people making direct eye contact. Um, you know, clearly we're seeing a team, we're seeing diversity. Um, the story opens with first person testimony, you know, quotes. Um, uh, you've got the portrait of the mayor, but he's in situ. And he's, and this to me is where it gets super interesting because he's shown in a New Bedford that is one version of New Bedford. It's not my favorite version of New Bedford. It's the empty version of New Bedford. And I, this is where I'm like, hmm, this is pretty interesting. Um, uh, and, and then within the article, there are some, there's not a ton of stats, if you will, but there are two critical ones. One, the discussion about the city, 95,000 residents described as a multicultural blue collar city. One thing that's interesting about that, when you actually look at the socioeconomics of the city today, whether or not New Bedford fits in blue collar, I think is, um, is debatable. So that's interesting in itself. And then the other really striking quote about 23% of New Bedford citizens living in, in poverty. So, you know, that is something that's gonna stick with people. Um, but each of these pieces contribute to this larger story and work together to do that. So I think it um, seeing, you know, really well uh, curated work like this is, is pretty interesting to dissect. And I'm sure folks might have some thoughts or questions on that when we get into the chat. Um, I hope you do. Um, and then just finally, as another example, I, I, I shared this briefly with some folks, but this is from the Selby, um, which is a fabulous site that looks into the lives of creatives. And I love this aggregation of different images, kind of this, these individual pieces of data that come together to make a visual composition to talk about a creative process. Um, that alone is really, really striking. Um, I, um, just to kind of drive home the point, you know, what I did is I then overlaid, this is an imaginary quote, but just to kind of, to, to demonstrate, you know, if you have this type of imagery and then you have this description from an artist saying, for me, this is what New Bedford is. This is what I feel. This is why I'm here. This is what I relate to kind of those words against the images, I think it's even more powerful if, if in fact these were images from New Bedford. And I do want to point out they're not. We haven't got New Bedford in the Selby yet, but we will, um, <laughs> that I know of at least. Um, and then as another example, the quantitative version, you know, it may be something as simple as since 2019, you know, more than 100 creatives have joined the creative directory, a snapshot of the city's growing creative energy. So you know, to basically a way to say, this is but one point, you know, look how deep and rich and wide this point is. And there's at least a hundred more, many, many more, just like this individual. So those are kind of things to, to play with as you think about, you know, composing and bringing together your data. And I think that's what I have. So I'm gonna leave you with one thought and two quick resources. One is there are a lot of tools like out 
a plot of tools out there. And um, Austin Cleon's work, Steal Like an Artist, um, you know, basically saying there's nothing new under the sun. There's just, there's a lot to learn from. Um, so go find something you like, and I'd say, and emulate it if you can, you know, that can get a little, a little challenging when you try to take that into research design, but I think it can be done. Um, and in particular, for those of you who are trying to really kind of up, up the data social media analytics game, um, HubSpot has amazing resources. They are a business and marketing company based out of Boston, but they're, they're global. Um, and they remind us social media is a two-way communication channel. It is not just one way. Um, and then there are some wonderful research uh, designed for social media case studies on the pulsarplatform.com that you can access as well. Uh, I'm going to stop my screen share, but I'm happy to pull it up if someone's got a specific question uh, on a slide. All righty. And let me see, it looks like there's some questions in the chat. Maybe we, oh, Scott Bishop did the public art map for New Bedford Creative. Yay, thank you, Scott, awesome. Everybody who's coming into the lunch, because this is kind of the lunchroom, because we're all back, this is our first day, everybody's back in the office. Everybody's like, oh, hey, what do you, well, that sounds really interesting. Can I have those slides? What, 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 how did I think? Yeah, no, and the footnotes and the slides and everything, that was fabulous, fabulous. Um, so I, my one question, because I'm always, I'm always in this movie, um, sort of saying the Fall River study for Fall River Eats or whatever that was. Okay, Fall River. Yep. Yep. Yeah, eat Fall River. Um, A, it started earlier because they used to do it um, like in, 10 years earlier. Yeah. So moment. yeah, it was a revived version of an earlier event, which is part yeah. of why the partnership, but, but changed. But yeah, changed. part of why the partnership kind of felt comfortable to take it on, but also realizing there was some great info on why it stopped too in terms of what <laughs> to sustain events like that yeah so if you had to round up you know your expertise and gyms and i don't know who else you pulled in and you know i know there's a coordinator but not the coordinator but just the outside because that was great marketing and great writing and great placement can you kind of say in order for any small event to do this it would cost you another thirty thousand dollars in expertise or twenty thousand or do you yeah. have a vision of that I do. That's about right. So the event cost, the direct cost was uh, it's either 20, between 20 and 25. The, the event actually made money the first mm. year. Um, mm. some, and some of that was in kind also given. But, um, but you know, there are, uh, we did have to do a little bit of tap dancing to be sure that we could mm. get, even Squarespace is relatively easy to use, but you still have to, the person putting the content in either, you know, you've got to workflow that so that you're either going to be the content creator also doing the input or you have to figure out how to put your team together so that you can give someone something that they can then just get up on the site. But okay. that, can, that, you know, y'all are so great at collaborating that, yeah. But 20, let's call it, tw let's call it 25. Um, and that included everything from the trolleys that night to advertising, police detail, it was a pretty, you know, uh, full, but, uh, you know, press. Yeah. Great. So the second question is, um, are there templates that you could either suggest to us or help us think about so that as a collaboration, you know, we're doing the summer in the seaport project, which I know you talked to Tanya about, but I mean, um, like on any event that we do or, you know, a, a long weekend or a, a Thursday night that includes the Zyterian doing their art, you know, it's kind of like, is there a way or a template that we can all put information into and get some sort of result out of, or is that too complicated? Um, I think, it, I think that's a great example of you probably need to refine your, your, um, your, your research question, like your data objective, like, are you trying to look at all, all of the zip code information as I think y'all are doing. Right. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because there's, it's essentially, if you do have data from multiple sources, you mm -hmm. can then even just stay within Excel and do pivot tables for which some people probably work with and, and like look at the correlations pretty easily to see 
Um, how many people were drawing from West, you know, zip codes from Westport versus Attleboro or wh wherever. Um, the, um, the one resource that I, uh, the, the, the HubSpot resource about social media, I think it also has some clues in there. I haven't looked at that template in detail, but they, um, there's some interesting mapping in terms of <clears throat> beginning with the end in mind as you map out your social media strategy. Okay. Um, I mean, there are social media, um, analytic programs at, that can both help you, uh, you know, get your content online efficiently and also some backend analytics. But when you're talking about bringing things together from different organizations, I think that's where um, that probably takes some custom mapping out to determine. But Get, even getting everybody to do like a com, like uh, I think a, a little bit of low hanging fruit that I can think of. Um, if, for instance, uh, you have reports, let's call it point of sale data, um, you know, just doing just doing some some summaries so that um, each organization can kind of start off and say, like in one page, like this is what we saw. You know, this is this was our trend over the. Thursday through Sunday, if that's the time period. Um, and and I, I think the discussion is actually might need to proceed then figuring out what the next step is of putting it together to so that you could see in a more robust way. Um, so for instance, or, or if um, uh, there are, you know, to get to the bottom of, was it Fun 107 or was it Instagram that was really driving people to the event? Or is it friends and family? So if you don't quite, I mean, zip code is a neutral value free kind of thing. You can kind of pick it out from point of sale. The other kinds of information about why or what motivated, you really either have to do interviews or, or surveys. Or and surveys. Okay. Yeah, and one thing I recommend, it's funny and I talked about this a little bit, is I'm, I'm a big fan of doing um, very short, semi-structured interviews so that if you can personally engage someone while they're at an event or after they've experienced a, an, an exhibit, for instance, like let's right. take Datmos, to say, hey, do you mind? We've got just a couple questions for you. We, we really hope you enjoyed the event. Give them, you know, where are you from? How did you hear about it? Why are you here? How many people are you with? You know, just a couple of questions so that you can have parallel construction to categorize those short responses. Mm -hmm. You know, just do this on a clipboard even, or an mm -hmm. iPad, but, but just keep it really simple. And then one or two open-ended questions about, you know, what, what, do, what do you think of this? You know, how, how did it, how did it um, impact you? You know, so that you, you do give people a moment and I think, and this is where I'm gonna kind of sit between being a researcher and a marketer. <laughs> In my mind, <laughs> this is your opportunity to make the personal connection with mm -hmm. the visitor. And if they then say, oh, you know, we are on our way to the Cape or we're taking our kids to look at colleges or we just live in the next town, we need a fun day trip. Then you, then that's your chance to also say, oh, well, you should stay and have a burger <laughs> or whatever <laughs> it is, you, you know, to do get them one step further in. That's, that to me is um, allowable in this type of context. I'm not worried about this, you know, you're not going to um, retroactively influence the data mm -hmm. <laughs> doing okay. that. Okay, great. Those are all good thoughts. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, real quick. And I don't think that takes doing it for even very many people. Like if you did that for 10 people, you would, you would have something to work with. If you could get it for a major event for 30 people, you would have plenty. Like that's, that is a full, full set of data to work with. That's a good, that just numerically, that ends up being a good sample for a wide range of things. So if you're sampling like that, do you have, to, do you have to say, okay, I'm going to ask every other person, or do you just ask 10 people who look friendly? So that, see, this, this is when we get into the, the quagmire that is the potential bias or um, just who will give you time. Um, I think 
you should be aware as the person, the question asker, that you're trying to reach a range of people. And um, not everyone's going to say yes. You know, some people don't want to do it. Um, but uh, you just have a positive energy. And um, I think you'll be surprised, especially in this time, what people will share with you. I'm going to jump in with just a, um, a comment. Am I on? Can you? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of research and, you know, um, actually um, my graduate degree is in program evaluation. So, um, but um, one of the things that I find a lot is that people ask ambiguous questions and you cannot interpret ambiguous questions answers. Um, so you have to be very careful. Like one of the most um, thing, thing that I teach people most is read your questions um, and see if there's a, another way to interpret it than the way you meant. Yeah. Um, particularly about time. Uh, people ask questions and the respondent can think, do they mean now? Do they mean before? Do they mean in the future? Um, if that's possible, you wrote the question wrong. Um, there's lots of other things along those lines, but there are some basics like that where you say, no, I can't, if I can only interpret the question one way, then I know what the, that the answers mean something. If I can come up with a second interpretation, my answers are meaningless. Yeah. That, that's great, great feedback. I think for those things that are discrete, you you also want people to be able to answer them quickly. Like it sh shouldn't take heavy lifting. Um, often if you uh, you develop a question set and then um, go ask, go get a colleague and pretend like they're the visitor and have them go through it with you, um, that usually will just help you fine tune, yeah. Yeah, and okay, so it also sounds like it's great to know you've got a resource of someone to turn to who y'all already know, but you know, just keep that in mind when you're doing your next <laughs> um, data data adventure. <laughs> so at some, at some point I would be interested, I mean, cause I did a lot of evaluation also um, of course putting myself through graduate school. Um, Dan, I think it'd be really interesting to think about um, training three or four people um, as volunteers. So we all have the same understanding or the same whatever and yeah. say, you know, would you commit <clears throat> to looking at one event a month and doing two hours worth of, I'll come to something at the co-creatives and talk to people. You mean as people. interviewers? Yeah, as interviews, because one mm -hmm. of the things we're having trouble right now with like the summer in the city uh, seaport stuff is um, thinking about, okay, if we've got this event, who, who are the interviewers and do they all, you know, you can get students, which is great, <clears throat> but um, is there a training set or are there a bunch of people like us who are really interested and at some point invested in who's coming downtown and who's participating? And we would each give, uh, you know, two or three hours or one, one night every two months. And, you know, if you, if you looked at six events and you got six people looking at six events or six people, you know, you'd get a fairly good, to Laurie's point, a fairly good um, data set um, quickly. And then we could actually have something to talk about when we start our next rounds. I think that would, I would, I'd be happy to um, both be trained and to talk to people about some events, not my own, but some other people's events. Mm -hmm. There might be, there might be, um, you know, some classes. There used to be um, at SMU. There used to be research classes that you could get to to join you out in the field. Um, you know, um, I talked to the dean at um, UMass, the dean of the business school, who's doing the evaluation and the tourism stuff. And there are no classes that he knew of last year. I mean, there may be some coming up, but I tried to get him to assign us some students. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and he helped us write a questionnaire. So um, I'm kind of on that sense, but I also think that those of us who are working downtown uh -huh. are going to be the most reliable sources of come on Tuesday. Can you spend two hours with me on Tuesday talking to five people? Sure. I, the um, <clears throat> a lot of the research stuff used to be in the sociology department too. I don't know anybody there. The okay. new dean of the business school has made his. He, it's his superpower. Um, doing tourist and um, visitor surveys for cultural um, organizations. Oh, great. That's what he's published on. Okay, great. Uh, and John, his name is John Williams. And he's very lovely. 
Um, he's very happy and he really wants to participate in some way. It's just that, I mean, the pandemic's made it difficult for everybody, right? Um, but I do think if there were a core of people who were willing to be like learners and knowledgeable and sharing information about um, downtown and downtown events, it would not only collect data which we would have in one space, but it might get people thinking about, these are fabulous questions to ask. And so, um, you know, can you get your waiters and waitresses to say to people, like the, the woman who ran Freestones used to do this training for everybody at the beginning of the tourist season and say, you know, we collect data. And so can you ask somebody what the great thing is they've seen in New Bedford and what the thing is they change? And she would come back with a whole bunch of information just from servers in the restaurant because um, she saw, they saw a really good, pro and it was so helpful. I was working at the Whaling Museum at the time, and it's like, it was so helpful because it helped the people at the Whaling Museum say, oh, actually, this is how people see us from the outside after they've, you know, had a bowl of chowder and a glass of wine. And so, you know, it's good information. Yeah. So it may be time to bring that idea back. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that's such a great idea. And between kind of your academic community, your business community, your museum and interpretive community, I think y'all, y'all got some really just fascinating views on this too. But, um, but I, uh, um, and it's also, I'd say that other thing is interesting. I'm, I'm kind of saying like talking to the visitors, if the visitor is from beyond New Bedford, but of course, figuring out how to talk to people who are from New Bedford, who are at these events, um, is really interesting too. And um, kind of, you know, that thinking of is this shifting their perception? Are they getting something that they had no idea was there in the community before through this experience? We might also want to consider um, thinking through a real um, research database. I mean, people look at spreadsheets like, you know, they're the be all and end all, but spreadsheets actually limit your ability to do analysis. Um, you really need to design, you need to first off think about what are my entities, what are their attributes, what are the relationships, and design those three things as completely separate buckets. Um, because, you know, otherwise, for example, one of the things you see a lot is um, people, will, you were talking about addresses before, and people will do address one, address two, address three, rather than um, home address, work address, vacation address. Um, and instead, have address and then have as a bucket and then have um, type of address, you now have something you can analyze. Um, you don't have to figure out which of those three are we looking at. You say, I want this attribute. Um, so there's, if somebody, you know, I mean, talking about some money here, but if somebody wanted to pay, you know, for a proper design and then a proper build, you could have a research database that people could feed, you know, into um, that would be much more useful than a whole bunch of independent spreadsheets um, collected you know, by people with varying levels of skill in doing that. Yeah, and, and I think the tricky part is also just bearing in mind what you have the bandwidth to manage. That's where I always overwhelm myself collecting too much data. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also what people have the bandwidth to actually input, you know, and yeah, but but finding, finding that balance in there, because I, I do agree with you, you know, even looking at, um, uh, when we're trying to understand where people are doing art, like how do we ask them, how do we understand, oh, that's their home studio, that's their studio they lease, or that's where they exhibit or work. It's, it, even that can get to be kind of a thorny question. Yeah, it's true. Um, it, it, also, if you have these kind of um, you know, informational buckets that, are, um, that can be sifted through, you can find things that never occurred to you to even look for. Um, for example, I was, the city hired me to do a piece of research back in around 1982 um, on the economics of the fishing industry and the economics of the fishing families. Um, and like to read what, that. huh? That's, that's, that's in my it, wheelhouse. Like it was really interesting, that. but what I, what my top finding turned out to be was that um, the fishing community had an AIDS problem because um, yeah. <clears throat> the people were coming in from the boats and they were going to um, the prostitutes and they were, <clears throat> the prostitutes were IV drug users who had an AIDS problem and they were bringing it home to their families. Um, and so, you know, that was not on anybody's radar, let alone mine as a researcher. Um, but suddenly there it was, you know, um, <clears throat> and we had a problem to address. So sometimes you really need to be open to these 
other things, but sometimes it's the way you collect data that lets you see things. Well, I want to thank you all for, um, for, yeah, for listening and for the input and the questions. And I'd say keep them coming. And um, uh, I think you all have my email, but you'll get one from me with the deck. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it.